Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just one moment as we wait for our other attendees to join. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining MHPA today for our webinar Wednesday series. My name is Patrick Kaur, and I have MHPA Senior Director of Membership and Partnership Engagement. I'd like to take a moment and provide a brief introduction for today's webinar. Today's presentation is in listen-only mode. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter them in the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please avoid using the chat feature for questions so we can get to as many as possible. Our presenters will address questions at the end of this presentation. The webinar slides will be sent to registrants by our presenters upon request, and you'll have their contact information at the end. You also find a recording of this webinar on MHPA's YouTube channel. I would like to welcome and thank Jesse Ceruto, Director of Health Communications and Creative Services, and Micah Dehenau, uh, Regional Vice President, Strategic Accounts, both with Virgin Pulse. Virgin Pulse, which was formerly WellTalk and WellPass, is a longtime supporter of MHPA and our members. Jesse and Micah will be presenting today's webinar, text messaging, do's, don'ts, and why now? And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Micah. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for the introduction. And good morning or good afternoon to everybody, depending on where you're joining us uh, from in the world today. Both Jesse and I are very excited to talk text messaging do's and don'ts in healthcare. Uh, so some of you may be using text messaging today to deliver info to your members, push them to take action on their healthcare, or just starting to consider how you might use texting in the future. So what Jesse and I are planning to talk through today are some best practices that we've identified and developed with our clients in text messaging. Uh, that regardless of where you are in your journey with texting will hopefully be helpful and informative. Okay, and as Patrick mentioned, uh, and in case you haven't heard, WellPass and WellTalk are now part of the Virgin Pulse uh, healthcare technology family. So as of last November, um, the acquisition was completed of WellTalk, bringing the capabilities of WellPass and WellTalk into the Virgin Pulse suite of services. All right, and a quick overview of Virgin Pulse. Um, we have over 150 million members uh, worldwide registered on our platform, and 73% uh, of those registrants have developed healthy habits along the way. So we're in the business of driving healthy actions. Um, of those same members, um, they are taking an average of 7,500 steps a day. So a very healthy population engaged with our uh, solutions uh, service through our platform. Uh, we have a very high uh, uh, rating for our application in the App Store, 4.9 out of five stars. And we're currently working with four out of five national major health plans and major health systems in North America. Um, with our <clears throat> health plan business, we're helping all types of plans, including Medicaid, uh, reach, activate, and engage members to take health actions. So we do things like uh, reach them with text messages, which we're talking about extensively today, uh, drive them in for recommended screenings, closing gaps in care, and helping them comply with uh, care recommendations, educating them on things uh, that are important, like COVID, vaccines, including flu shot, and uh, uh, a new and interesting upcoming recertification requirements for Medicaid. So they're engaged in using the benefits that Medicaid plans offer to them uh, in the best way possible to keep them and their family healthy. Uh, and we do this starting with uh, a data-driven approach. So we start with data. Uh, we build predictive models on that data to identify um, health risks in a population uh, and the channels that individuals are most likely to engage on. Once that insight is developed, we develop a multi-channel outreach approach to engage the, the individuals within a population to take actions 
like use benefits that Medicaid plans have made available to them, uh, talk with live services for help with specific issues, adhere to prescribed medications, come in for uh, vaccines or well visits, uh, and comply with pre-certification requirements, which are coming up and becoming very relevant. Um, as Patrick mentioned, I'm Micah Dehano, Regional Vice President of Strategic Accounts for the Virgin Pulse Health Plan Business. Um, and I'm joined today by Jesse Ceruto. Jesse, do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, thanks, Micah. Um, so as you see, my name is Jesse Ceruto, Director of Health Communications and Creative Services here. Um, you know, before joining Virgin Pulse, I've done a little bit of everything. I've been a tobacco cessation counselor. I've worked as a community health educator in nonprofits. I've worked for a National Cancer Institute as a researcher in university settings. Um, and kind of all, all, of, all of that knowledge got me thinking <clears throat> how important texting was, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And I joined WellPass. Um, so kind of my four-way into Virgin Pulse started at WellPass, which is completely focused on texting. So we have those big five, now six, more on that later, um, health population SMS programs, like Care for Life, Text for Baby, Text to Quit. Um, and then WellTalk acquired WellPass and I joined the bigger family. And now we are here at Virgin Pulse. And I'm just super excited because there's so much more uh, campaigns and content and creative and just so much more to reach audiences and engage and really motivate that behavior change. Um, so sorry, that was a long intro, but very excited to be here. And thank you all for joining us. Um, Micah, go ahead, please introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely, so, so let's get into it. Um, we're, as you can tell, both Jesse and I are really excited about the application of texting to drive healthy actions. Uh, we've had a lot of success in the past. Um, we are working with our clients on this on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're excited to share lessons learned uh, best practices and things that uh, we, we should be avoided when setting up text messaging strategies. Um, so let's start with one of the big challenges we know that many Medicaid plans, pretty much all Medicaid plans in North America are facing, which is uh, redetermination. There's a lot on the line when it comes to staying enrolled and texting can be part of the solution to reach and engage more members in recertifying. We'll talk through how um, we're setting up different campaigns to do that today with some of our members. There's still hesitancy about texting them, uh, both for recertification and other applications like driving flu shots and driving gaps in care closure. Um, there's concerns over regulation and working with TCPA, uh, how, to, uh, how to craft the content appropriately, um, how to create the outreach, and outreach and how to orchestrate multi-channel campaigns. So considering text message among all of the other outreach that uh, you're doing as a health plan today. So we're gonna hopefully answer those questions and hopefully share how you can prepare for the challenge uh, and also drive health actions of other types to support your, your members' health. Yeah, and so before we get started and dive a lot deeper into all of this, we just wanna ask everyone to tell us how you're using text messaging today. So Patrick's gonna open up the poll now. Some of you, I think we're trying to answer it earlier. So now's your chance. Um, if you don't see an applicable answer in your poll, uh, go ahead and put in the chat, you know, anything, however you're thinking of using it, how you are using it currently, we want to know where you're at. Um, so you'll see that it's the question is just how you're texting today. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're educating members on health topics that can include cancer screenings and why that's important, or the importance of redetermination right Recert recertifying for your Medicaid. Um, maybe you're reminding them to take action. So going for a flu shot, updating their contact information. Uh, maybe you're looking for long-term relationships and behavior change. So not so much one and done approach, but that long-term building and sustaining of the behavior change. Maybe you're doing all of them. Maybe you're doing none of them. Um, so just answer which one fits better. And like I said, use that chat. If you could think of other ways that you're using it that we didn't cover here. Um, or maybe you're saying none of the above and you have some ideas of how you want to use it. We want all your thoughts. Okay, still have time if you'd like to answer. Okay, I'm about to shut down. So if anyone wants to answer, you have one more chance. Okay, here we go. I'll share the results. All right. So it looks like most people about... Well, 33% of you said you're doing everything. So that's awesome. 37% of you said you're not currently doing any of that. 
Um, so like, a, if, if you have like ideas of how you want to use it, or if you're like, I don't even know where to start, start putting stuff in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, a lot of you are also using it to remind for the specific actions. So kind of that flu shot, contact information, um, get a cancer screening and 4% are doing it really solely on, on education. So this is really interesting to look at. Um, what do you think, Micah? Does this kind of reflect with what you're seeing in client implementations currently? Uh, it, it's it's a little bit surprising, actually. Um, I'm surprised that only four percent are educating yeah. members on health topics. That seemed low to me. Um, certainly, with the clients we're working with, if they're using text, they are using it for some basic education at the very least. So that that's surprising. Um, yeah. The remind oh, them to take specific health actions. I think that's really interesting as well. Um, a quarter. Yeah. And I do uh, see someone said medication refill reminders. Yep, that's that's a great use case. A lot of people use that. Yeah. Yep, yeah. and prescription adherence. I know that's that's a kind of relatively new in the industry, but we're seeing a lot of adoption of that as well. Well, great. Thanks for part participating in that, everyone. Um, so we can get into just some some facts, some data, why text messaging and why now? Um, I'm sure maybe there's some of you that don't, but I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, use texting in your day-to-day -day life. 91% um, of consumers, that middle data point there, prefer text over voicemail. So I know like when I sign up for reminders from my doctor's appointments or for anything that I have coming up, whatever kind of marketing it is, not just for health, but I sign up for those text reminders. I have my phone around me always because that's what I know. Like, even if I put something in my calendar, like my phone is kind of where everything is. And texting is the fastest way to get to me. That's what I tell people at work. That's what I tell my friends, you know, I'm not gonna listen to a voicemail. I'm gonna see my phone. I'm gonna see my text. So that's the best way to reach me when you need me. Um, so I just love texting. And I know like in my day to day and when I was a community health educator, I saw it a lot that people like to get text. It's just the easiest, fastest way to get someone's attention. You know, email is wonderful and I love communicating through email, but an email is going to sit in the inbox until someone has time to read it. A text, they're going to read it. 95% of text messages get read within three minutes. So, you know, you're getting their attention in the immediate, in the immediate moment that they, they're ready for it. Um, and then one really fascinating data point for the Medicaid audience is that 60% of low-income Americans use their phone for access health information. Um, so you know that it's being used for the health information and the health resources, not just for other kind of marketing or non-educational purposes. And then we have some other facts here. 81% um, of Americans say they text. Um, I'm sure that that number has even gone higher because I know my 70 year old mother loves texting and it's how we communicate every day. If we're not talking, we're texting at least like all day, every day. Um, it's lower costs channel, right? For you as the, as, the as the one sending it to the consumers, it's lower cost. It costs the least out of all the channels. And it's just the fastest way to get information in someone's fingertips and like literally in their fingertips. Um, and a new data point that we looked into, 90% or more of US cell phones have unlimited texting. Um, so we know that was a, a really big concern in the past because what if people have to pay for their text messages? So the nice thing is that more and more unlimited plans are getting incorporated for most consumers. Um, and I, like th these data sets and the other stats that we looked at, it makes me really think like, man, texting is super effective for communication. Uh, so what do you think, Micah? Like, how does that fit into what you've seen? Yeah, it's, a, it's certainly, it's such an integral part of our everyday lives. You'd be hard to find somebody that doesn't text and it's such an effective mechanism to deliver information quickly in short bites uh, and drive very basic actions, uh, which is when you consider that in a health plan context, there's a lot of things you want your membership to do. It's a trusted means, it gets read, people respond, people take action, and uh, it's a reliable place to send information. Um, so a lot of the plans that we're working with today, um, some of the concerns that come up are, uh, are we are, are people going to be mad at us because we're eating up their their text limits? And that's not the case. So at nearly all uh, US uh, Medicaid members now, if they have cell phones, have unlimited texting, like Jesse mentioned. Um, the other concern that comes up too is 
Now, are these good phone numbers that we're reaching out to our Medicaid members on? There's some suspicion that uh, they're, they're changing phone numbers a lot. And what we found generally is the uh, individual cell phone numbers in a Medicaid plan is a more consistent location of contact uh, than compared to even their address. So it is maybe the most reliable place to reach out and talk to your members. So we're, yeah, we're excited really and we're point. kind of pushing the frontier of, uh, of, of texting with our clients. Okay, so if you're ready to text like a pro, uh, we're excited to walk you through our best practices, uh, things that you should stop doing or consider stop doing if you're doing these today uh, based on lessons learned from uh, working with our clients, things you should start if you haven't, uh, and some missteps to avoid. Yeah, so let's get into the strategies we see lead to ineffective texting. So they're not going to deliver. It's not what you want to do. Um, that first point, texting irrelevant information. So you need to know your audience and text the way that they're going to respond to. So if you're not looking into that, if you're not planning out like when to send something, at, not just at what time, but what time of the day, um, and just things that your audience doesn't want to know, it, it's just not relevant for them. So that's the one thing that's going to drive more opt-outs. Um, and it, you just want to make sure you're directing the campaign to the right audience. Um, this goes hand in hand with using the wrong message. So if you're not crafting the message properly or the focus of the message is just not landing where your audience needs to hear, they're not going to engage with the text message. They're not going to take an action. Um, you know, if that flu shot message is wrong, it's not going to want the, make them go to the clinic and get a flu shot. So you really want to make sure the right message is being sent. Uh, at limiting your usage of texting in general due to opt out. So we know that opt in, sorry, opt in is a really big concern for a lot of plans. Um, and we see that just kind of stop people on their tracks. So they don't engage in texting at all because they're worried about it. But the good news is there's lots of ways that we, we can help you, um, that you little strategies you could try. Um, so it's not lost. Don't let opt in, getting scared of getting the right opt in hold you back, look into it, work with a provider or a texter that knows what they're doing, which goes into the next bullet, trying to do this on your own, right? There is a lot to consider uh, when it comes to designing the right frequency, looking at the right audience, the right message for that audience, the right time to send the message, um, how to get opt-in, when to use opt-out. It's a lot to take on on your own. Um, so that might be why you're a little bit more fearful to start and why maybe if you started, you're not getting the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, so definitely try to partner with someone that knows what they're doing, um, that's your partner and not just kind of throwing things at you, but they're working with you to make your goals and your concerns top priority. Um, and then now that we went through what not to do, let's try to see what you should do, which I sprinkled some in there as we were going. Um, using data to improve your message targeting. So sometimes you may not have the right claims data. Maybe you have some lags in your data in your data coming through and you're scared about how to target the right people because what if you don't have the right data? Uh, use data analytics to help you. So if there's a good data set out there, you could use that to your advantage to try to target the people that you're not sure about so that you have your reach is larger and you're getting a better data set. Uh, right messages using the right tone and the right length. So sometimes a message can be too short, not include enough information. Sometimes a message could be way too long. Um, a lot of times what I see when clients try to craft their own messages, it, the intention is great. I see what they're going for, but it's too formal. It, it sounds like a robot made the text. And when I get something like that, my first reaction is, okay, this person, this company doesn't care about me. I'm not engaging. So making sure that tone is right, you know, finding that nice balance between friendly and informative, I'm making sure the length is just right, which is hard to find that balance. Uh, include calls to actions and links to additional resources. Another problem I've seen a, a bunch of times that there's really no call to action. It's just kind of just some random information and it's like, okay, what are you supposed to do with this? So always including some sort of call to action and when appropriate linking to resources like a URL or a phone number uh, to get them more information if that's needed. And then 
One of my favorites, integrating texting into multi-channel campaigns. So figuring out, okay, when is it, it's fine to just use texting or when will other channels and involving texting in the right time, you know, if, is it before or after the emails at, at the same time? So when to use other channels to really bump up your campaign, make your reach wider and really get more juice out of that texting. Um, so considering all of these do's and don'ts that we've kind of gone through today, um, I'm sure you have some lessons learned from client implementations, Micah. So do you have anything that you wanna go through to kind of show like, all right, here's from experience. I do. And one, one thing I was thinking of here, Jesse, um, is, is being concise. And I know you spend every day working on content length and trying to kind of drive the biggest impact possible in the shortest amount of characters you can. Yeah. Um, do you know what TLDR means? I, I had to look it up. Too long didn't read, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I learned this. I learned this recently. <laughs> well, I did too. I learned it probably like you. I learned it the hard way, right? Yeah. Sending long messages to big group texts with friends. And I kept getting back this TLDR. TLDR. Had, I'm like, all right, I assume they understood that. Yeah. But too long didn't read. That's a big theme here. And making sure that you have a good content partner or somebody knows how to create the right message in the right space is key. Yeah. All right. Um, some missteps that we've seen or heard from our clients that are really important to avoid besides the TLDR situation. Um, one is, is, is that's coming up a lot now is forgetting to plan for state oversight, which is it's, it's a big factor in timeline and getting the messages built and out to the, your membership in, in a reasonable amount of time. Jesse, I know you've had, um, you've run into this a lot with some of our clients. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I see it all the time. Um, recently, there was kind of that redetermination example that we've been talking about earlier, where they wanted to send this message. They knew the state, they, the state had given them a message that wasn't very good. And I'm sure you guys have been, have seen this your, yourselves, um, but they gave it to us the week before the message was go, supposed to go out. So, you know, I tried to edit it, I tried to craft it, but they sent it back to state and there wasn't enough time to get this message improved. So that dropped the efficacy of the message, right? Like it was repetitive, it was really wordy, it was too long. There, there was just a lot going on in the message that was really easy to solve for if there had been more time. Um, so that's always something like plan for that state oversight, plan for that period of time that your state is gonna take. Um, I know some of you are really lucky and may not have as much like Colorado, uh, sometimes you guys get lucky and you don't need as much of that state oversight. And we're so much more flexible with those plans. Um, so I like to remind everyone that needs to go through that state oversight plan for the time it's going to take plan early. You know, if we still have three months for the public health emergency, you're already late if you're going to start planning now because you want all of that pre-approved, ready to go for approval um, so that you don't wait till the last minute. It's really important. Yeah. Agreed. And we continue to run into this. So working with the state oh, is critical and being proactive is, is even better because you can make sure that you're helping kind of dictate the messaging that you will be sending to your clients and getting their approval as opposed to the opposite. Um, another we run into is working with inexperienced partners or trying to do it on your own without having the right skill set in-house. TCPA is very important. So um, all it takes is to mess this up once to completely derail uh, a campaign program and abandon the channel. So ensuring that you have somebody who knows how to navigate this, knows how to get all of this tested correctly, um, knows that the messaging is appropriate, fits within the bounds of HIPAA um, is very critical. Uh, and then I know we've got some questions coming in and a couple around member abrasion. That's very critical as well. And we run into that a lot. Um, for instance, we uh, were working with a client last year, um, and we did a bit of an audit on their campaigns and outreach across the course of the year. So there was no central hub uh, that was used to orchestrate all of the messaging that the membership was getting delivered to in a year. So one group was sending benefits cards, another group was sending uh, emails, another group was sending voice uh, outbound IVR messages, and they were not coordinating with each other on when those messages were sent and the topics for those messages. Uh, when we completed the audit, we found that some individuals were getting three messages 
uh, in the same day covering three different topics and why that's really important to avoid uh, uh, and, and avoid member abrasion is it hurts the trust that you're attempting to build with your Medicaid population. Once you hurt that trust, um, they'll stop, uh, they'll either ignore a uh, messaging you send them, um, opt out, or not trust the content they're, that they're getting. So orchestrating and planning your messaging across the course of the year, across your departments, um, and the channels that you're considering using is very critical. Um, and then adding channels uh, increases reach, but it's very, very important uh, to apply those carefully and understand what your members prefer to engage uh, with and use that insight to create kind of a comprehensive messaging strategy. Yeah, and if I can jump in, because I think it's still relevant, some of the questions we're getting. So um, one of them is how long is too long? Um, I would say 300 is the, the 300 characters, including spaces, is kind of like your soft spot. That's the balance. You don't really want to go too much further than that. Less than that is even better, but it's really hard to stay in that 160, which is kind of the old school true text message. Um, and then I saw something about links. Um, how effective is including links and text to websites, additional information? It depends on the context, right? Um, so a lot of clients throw in links links because they think, okay, it's good, you know, more information. But I always try to point out if the link you're sending someone to, they have to go through and jump through three different loops to get through to where you want them to, then it's not worth it. So unless that link is exactly where, like if you're telling them sign up on the form here, but when you click on the link, it goes to the home page and you have to scroll to the Medicaid section. And then you have to look through and try to guess which is the form. That's not going to be effective. That's just going to Going to make them get kind of frustrated and forget it and not try. Um, and I'm sure you guys know this from experience sometimes when you get text messages or even emails. So it is effective if you use it the right way. Direct link to the direct information you want someone to see. If the message is already too long or you've got more than one URL or a phone number in a URL, that starts getting tricky. So it's going to be depending on the content, the context of the text message, but they're effective if used properly. That's what I would say. And I All think right. there's some other questions, but I think we can maybe save some of them um, as they come up for other of our conversations, but keep, keep bringing up uh, chats and questions, please. We'd love to see that. Yep, thank you. So we wanna get uh, into a couple examples of how our clients are using texting today. Uh, so we're, we're going to walk through a few applications that we've had a lot of success with, our clients have had a lot of success with, um, and talk through how we've kind of built those campaigns and some lessons learned. All right. So this first one, um, this actually was a Colorado Medicaid plan, Colorado Access. You may have seen us do some webinars with them, and they've participated before. Um, but they had a COVID-19 digital engagement campaign. Um, and this was all through SMS. Um, we launched it, uh, I think it was early 2020. And it was an ongoing campaign with new members of the plan getting enrolled as it went. Um, and this was all the regional plans, the CHIP plans, and some other kind of line of businesses for the Medicaid plan itself. Um, the goal was to reach members with COVID-19 information um, and resources. So, you know, that was a very, it was ever changing what we got in 2020 about COVID, right? So making sure things were up, up to date, um, no vaccines at that time. So what to know if vaccines come and what to do in the meantime, things like that. Uh, members received their welcome text and then eight different texts every two business days. So we planned it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we made sure that this was the only campaign they were getting at the time so that it wasn't too abrasive, like Micah was saying, which is really important. Uh, we also wanted to avoid any dual messages on the same day. And we Monday, Wednesday, Friday was a nice cadence because it was information that people needed right away. So this was spaced out so that it didn't take too long to get all the messages, but there was still a break so they didn't feel overwhelmed and like we were bombarding them with information. Um, and then once they complete the program or they completed the program when they received all eight and the welcome message, 
Um, and it was just really successful. You know, um, this I think was about nine months in, I, I feel like is what we were told. And in nine months in, we had about 283,000 members reached, uh, over 2.3 million messages that went out. And the opt-out rate was pretty low. It was about 10% opt-in. So, you know, you have 90% retention of members still receiving their, their COVID information, which was really great to see. So Jesse, maybe on this note, one of the questions that came in over chat was how do we manage opt-outs and what do we do after an individual's opted out? Could, could you maybe speak a little bit to uh, our process for handling opt-outs? Yeah, I mean, so legally you have to, you just, if someone opts out, you have to let them opt out. You have to remove them. Um, sometimes there's the capacity to be able to opt out of certain campaigns. So maybe they don't want the COVID messages, but they do want pregnancy messages or flu shot messages. Um, so sometimes depending on the context, we have that, which I think like, if that is an opportunity that you could take, take that. Um, the other approach that we've taken is making sure that in the unsubscribe message. So once I text stop or stop all, you get this unsubscribe message that says you are now unsubscribed from this program and you will not receive any more texts. Um, we add in the back of all of those text messages, how to re-engage, which is usually, this is probably across any platform you are using, um, but you do want to make sure this is how it works for the platform that you're using. Um, you'd add in text start to begin message, to begin receiving messages again. Um, so that would be our recommendation. Always let someone know if they change their mind, how to go about it, because um, unfortunately, but it's looking out for consumers. So it is a good thing. Once someone says stop, you can only send them that one message it, message confirming the stop. You can't really like do anything else until they say they're okay texting again or receiving text messages again. So if that didn't answer your question, ask more questions, but yeah. hopefully that yeah, covers And we'll, we'll, we can bring this back up at the end as well. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, another example of where we've had success with text messaging is uh, around gaps in care, specifically flu shot. Uh, so one of our, our health plan partners, uh, we were working to minimize the flu impact by boosting immunization rates uh, with personalized messaging. So we conducted an outreach of about 625,000 plus members across six different states, uh, educating those members why it's important to get their flu shot and encouraged early vaccination. So early and often was kind of the, the key to that campaign. Um, we saw that the campaign drove an increased immunization rate among children and adults of uh, over 16%, specifically in Kentucky and Arizona. Uh, but this is a great application. It's a reminder. It's a gap in, uh, a gap in care. Um, it's uh, very valuable in terms of ratings to get the members to get their flu shot. Uh, and it's a cheap, effective, quick application of texting. Yeah, and now we can jump in into another great use of texting, our Text for Baby program. Um, some of you may already know a lot about Text for Baby, some of you may not. Um, so we'll just kind of go through as, I'll go quick, but not too quick. And of course, jump in with any questions in the chat if you have them. Um, so let's dive into it. Text for Baby, what is it? Uh, Text for Baby is, it basically sets up pregnant women or pregnant people uh, for, just having a safe pregnancy and the goal of the text for baby program from day one is to limit premature births um, so that babies and moms are safer. Um, so text for baby is completely over SMS. It's over the nine months of pregnancy and then it covers all 52 weeks of baby's first year of life. It was put together with a bunch of governmental and uh, nonprofit partners to kind of make the messages as great as we can make it as concise yet informative as possible. Uh, and, and we know it's been working because over 1.3 million people have signed up for text for baby over the years and more and more are coming. Um, recently we refreshed it. So this refreshed uh, content, every single piece of content was looked at and updated for just a fresh tone of voice and to make sure things were still kind of relevant. Um, I always use this example. This wasn't in text for baby, but in one of our other programs, it says something about rewards, going out and buying a DVD 
And we're like, hmm, maybe DVDs aren't as relevant anymore. So, you know, even like little things like that. And then more important things like guidance have changed. So postpartum, um, now there's new guidance on how often a woman and, and when uh, should get a postpartum visit checkup. So that is implemented into the refresh version. And we had Harvard Medical School do a clinical review of all of the content and say it's good to go. And we had another content partner, FAIR, which is um, Allergy and Research Center. I always forget the full name. I think full Food and Allergy Research and Education. Uh, apologies if I messed that up. But they looked into it and they gave us specific content for how to introduce food to babies as they're growing up and as they're developing. And then specific information on foods that may have more of an allergic reaction, like peanuts, you know, like how to introduce that before you know what your baby may be allergic to. So lots of great content in the refresh. And then, so this is kind of an example of how the messaging tracks work in Text for Baby. So, of course, during the nine months of pregnancy, you're going to have that prenatal track. So it's all about, you know, when to go to the doctor, what's important to do, like take your prenatal vitamins, folic acid, all of that, signs to look out for in case, what if you're, you're scared you're having a miscarriage, you know, what to look out for, when to go to the doctor, what screenings you need. So all about how to take care of yourself in that prenatal phase. Then postpartum is a mix of on the top you see well child too. So it's kind of both, right? There's a postpartum reminder section that's specifically for that very important postpartum visit or the two to three that you now have with new Medicaid and um, overall guidance. And then the well child part of it. So it's about taking care of mom after delivery and post birth, but also baby. So baby's going through a lot of changes really quick. So it's what to look out for, um, what you should be doing with baby and also little reminders supportive messages about, you know, you're doing a great job. We know this is hard. You got it. What you should do to make sure you're getting some mommy time for yourself, things like that. Um, so that kind of goes into the early parenting as well. And then, like I said, FAIR was a great partner we had. So they helped us out with the food and how to introduce food slowly and safely to baby. And then we have some kind of outcome information here. So some results that we've seen, there's been 40% increase in receiving a flu shot. So there is also a flu shot module. Um, and again, with this refresh, we've really revamped it. Um, the earlier version was kind of like check-ins with the same information. And we took those lessons learned. We took a lot of feedback from real users that were engaging in the program and letting us know their thoughts, their feelings. Um, so one example is with the flu shot kit module, let's call it piece of the program. Um, different messages throughout. Uh, there's a lot more kind of reminders built in and checkups and education sprinkled through. So it's just a lot more, there's a lot more variety to keep people engaged and not feel so robotic. Um, but we do see a, an increase in receiving the flu shot. Um, and that's 3% or three times the impact among those that didn't get the flu shot module. 35% fewer missed prenatal appointments and significantly higher level of knowledge overall in the health topics that's included in Tux for Baby, like safe sleep, infant feeding, the best time to deliver and the definition of full-term full pregnancy. And I also wanna kind of add with that 35%, it's really interesting when you look at overall text messaging, text messaging data, um, we don't like to call engagement just people that are responding to a text because what we've noticed when you look at data and you look at a really, like in-depth claims analysis with a partner Medicaid plan or health plan, people still take actions because they received a medic uh, text message, even if they're not answering the text message. So I think that's a really key takeaway that everyone should kind of, because sometimes you look at engagement usage based on how many people are answering the text and you might get a little discouraged because those numbers aren't super high, but what claims analysis shows us is people are still, even if they didn't say, yes, I went to my appointment or yes, I plan to go, they're getting that text message and they're going to the appointment because the text message reminded them whether or not they answered. So just a little thing that I think is a big thing to keep in mind when you're looking at that engagement data. Um, and then 65% talk to their doctor about a message. So again, this shows they may not be responding or maybe it's just a series of one-way messages, but they're taking that digesting it and taking it back into their real life world and talking to their doctor or maybe their partners um, or family and friends about the text messages they're getting. 
and greater than 90%. So more than 90% would recommend text message, text for baby to a friend. So we love seeing that sharing, sharing the new information that they're getting with others. So Jesse, um, taking it back to your point around engagement and, and yep. considering uh, a text message successful, not necessarily if it was responded to, but if it, the message was reviewed by the person and drove an action. I'm thinking now, if we tie it back to that poll number we saw, where only 4% of the respondents said that they're sending health um, reminders and information through text message. I wonder if some of that hesitancy is because the data doesn't show cleanly that people are responding to texts. But on your note, it's a great way to drive action, even if people aren't responding or, or directly engaging with the text messages. Yep, absolutely. I mean, and let us know if that's the case, if you guys have been discouraged when you see people aren't responding to the text. But I even in my day to day, I do that all the time. <laughs> like I'll get a text message that's prompting me for a response. But, you know, I read it, I put it away, I got busy with work. But then the next day, I'm like, oh, right, that text message said I should fill out this form. And then I go and Google it and bring it up. Um, so it's it's not necessarily because you're not seeing that real engagement in the text doesn't I mean they're not engaging in it in real life. Um, and one good way that I would measure kind of is this campaign working or success or successful is that opt out percentage. Is it lower or higher than that 10%? Uh, if you have a lot of people, a lot of retention, but you still don't have a lot of that quote unquote engagement, your campaign's doing really well. People are reading it and they're not opting out. So that means that they're interested in what they're getting. Yeah, great point. Yeah. Um, and then here's some just more results. Um, and this is really actually, these results are really important because it talks about the long lasting habits that are built because of the Text for Baby program. So you could see here 18 to 26% were more likely to attend a child well visit. 20% were more likely to attend an adolescent well visit. So this is carrying over from those 52 weeks of the first year of life. And then 44% were more likely to attend a dental visit. So that's even carrying it more because um, Text for Baby doesn't have that much of an emphasis on dental visits, but it's still now, it's part of that habit that's forming as people are getting these messages with the health information and it's really guiding them on what you should do and applying that to other scenarios. So love to see that and it's really important. Um, and now you know that we've gone through some of these use case examples. Um, Micah, I wonder if we can kind of go back to that redetermination that we talked about earlier, um, since we know that texting is a great way to engage members. Yeah, and you know we're really excited, as you could likely tell, of, of the applications for texting with pre and postnatal care. And one of the reasons we're most excited about it is because of the clinical outcomes and the cost involved with doing it wrong or, or not engaging. There's a lot of money on the line uh, for pre and postnatal care and ensuring that uh, mothers stay on regimen to do the right things during their pregnancy saves health plans a lot of money. Um, one other interesting application that's coming up is this redetermination. So everybody is likely aware that we are still considered in a global health emergency that's coming to an end here shortly. And estimates uh, project that um, once this completes, 15 million covered Medicaid beneficiaries uh, may lose their coverage, which is a big deal and a significant financial impact and a significant impact to budgets. So it is important to stay ahead of this. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, there are 12 months uh, of time available to return to normal eligibility and enrollment operations, uh, but there's really no time to spare in setting this up if you're planning to apply text messages or some other outreach to take care of redetermination. So for instance, um, we put some examples here with uh, campaigns we're working on with some of our Medicaid clients to address recertification. So don't wait update your contact info now and ensure you get the latest alerts uh, from your Medicaid plan. Uh, Medicaid extensions are ending soon. Make sure your info is updated to get important notifications. And back to that question around links, this is a great application of links. If you can uh, direct somebody to the exact location you would like them to go to to update their information, begin the recertification process, this is perfect. 
The key though is not making them jump through a number of hoops or sending them into a location where they're going to have to find the information on their own. Yep. All right, well, uh, <laughs> we're, we're excited to wrap up here. Um, we're excited for the future of text messaging and the different applications. We're working with our clients every day on different innovative applications of text messaging, but we hope there's a couple takeaways. Um, one, text messaging is desired, effective, and affordable. So it is still one of the cheapest, most cost-effective ways to drive actions in a health population. Um, members like to use it. If you're delivering the message uh, in the right way, uh, with the right content, to the right person without, uh, while, while ensuring uh, abrasion is avoided, great mechanism to get your population to do what you'd like them to do. Um, there's multiple ways to use text messages. So you can have uh, programmatic, uh, like we walked through with the text for baby. You can have two-way texting. So you could actually engage in a secure dialogue with your members through text messaging um, while balancing HIPAA. I saw that was another uh, question that we got up in, in the chat. Um, driving healthy actions with texting programs is proven. Um, we have a lot of solutions we support in Virgin Pulse. Um, texting is one of the cleanest clinical outcome solutions that we uh, partner with our clients to deliver today. Um, it's a very strong business case. It's cheap and it drives big outcomes, um, relatively cheap. Um, and lastly, an experienced partner can help you launch fast. So if you don't have the expertise in-house with somebody who understands TCPA, understands texting strategy, uh, or you don't have a partner in place today um, it's important uh, to, to work with one to make sure that you're checking all the boxes and you're doing this right. All right, Jesse, anything to add? No, all, all very important. And I just kind of, I, I think as we were talking, I'd remind everyone just again, uh, the true meaning of engaged and how you look at an effective campaign that's texting versus not. Keep that in mind. Yep. So as you can probably tell, if you have any questions, either today while you're on this webinar or you think of one later, uh, Jesse and I are happy to help uh, or get the right people um, uh, engaged to help answer questions around texting, texting strategy, different programs. Um, we, we love to work with this stuff. Um, we love to hear what you're doing, um, what's worked, what's not working, and uh, we're certainly happy to help at any point in time you're ready to pursue it. Okay, so I know we answered a number of questions along the way, but let's check the chat and see if there's any that we should uh, address before we wrap up. Yeah, there's a good amount here to scroll to the top. Here's a good one, Jesse, maybe if you don't mind me asking this to you, how do we define reached? Uh, is there an algorithm that shows that a message has been viewed by a member or person that we've delivered the message to? That's a great question. So. Usually there isn't a way, because texting isn't like email, there is just no way to ensure that a text message was delivered in red, for example. What we can say is a message was sent to a valid phone number. Um, so that's what we consider reach. It's did this message get sent? So sometimes let's say we get a list of 1000 mobile numbers from a client, all 1000 probably aren't gonna get it because some of those are gonna be invalid phone numbers. Um, so that's not considered part of the reach, for example. Um, but unfortunately, I'm sure technology will find a way one day, but it's not like an email where you can say how many opened a text message. Um, that's just not something you can do. Okay, here's, here's another good one um, regarding uh, different languages. So assuming we have a Medicaid population where we should consider Spanish or English as a second language or some other language, how do we approach um, uh, that within a texting campaign strategy? That's a great, great, great question. Um, so we're used to working with Spanish all the time because uh, in Medicaid, most states um, regulation says you need to do in Spanish. So um, Spanish is a great example of something we just add on to. You get English and Spanish messages. It, it works just as well. Um, and we know we see a lot of engagement, sometimes even more with Spanish audience. It depends on the campaign, but sometimes you'll see that more engagement, more um, less opt outs in the Spanish campaigns, funny enough. Um, other languages are a little tougher, um, so it's not completely undoable. 
it's doable, but there are some characters that aren't supported um, in all phones. So that's just a little trickier to consider. I would say it's still worth asking whoever you're using to text with, whatever platform or partner you're using. Um, but that there is some stuff that runs into that because it's just not English characters and most phone numbers are used to that. Um, so just a, a few other things to consider when you're doing that, but Spanish, easy breezy, we got Spanish down. And I would say just, sorry, like as a side note, Sometimes you, you really need to consider cultural implications of language too, not just it's literally translating it to another language. Um, so we do like to fix the English content itself to remove any sort of slang, you know, that's like English use or in America even, not just maybe in Britain, it's not the same, right? Like we know that there's different dialects of the same language. Um, especially for Spanish, if any of you speak Spanish, you know, there's so many different countries, so many different dialects, things mean a different thing for one person than they do to, uh, to another. So always consider that too. Um, and you want to think about how to make the Spanish, the English itself a little more basic so that any translation services you're using don't translate exact word for word phrases that mean nothing in another language. Um, and if a campaign is specifically to one population, um, considering cultural or race, you want to, that needs to go into the content. Um, so just a little more to consider. It's not just like straight up translating the content. There's a lot more nuances that you want to consider when you do it. Great. That, here's another great question. So, uh, regarding results and when we measure results or impact from a texting campaign. Yeah. At what time, at what point in time do we measure results after a gap in care message is sent? So for instance, Jesse, our, our flu shot campaign, at what point in time would we evaluate how many individuals got flu shots compared to the amount that received messaging and reminders around flu shots? Yeah, that's a great question. It's going to depend a lot on your state and the way that your health plan works. I would say nothing less than three months later, because you need that, that claims lag. Um, that we all know and don't love. Uh, so you need to account for that lag of claims data being processed through the systems. Um, if you can wait longer, six months, you'll get better data because sometimes there's a little more lag. You know, depends on like some health plans have a really good partnership with pharmacies. So if someone goes to a pharmacy and gets the flu shot, that gets updated really quickly. But maybe they went to a community clinic or their provider or they change providers and that information isn't linked yet. So, you know, there's just so much to consider in the time. The more time you give yourself, the better. Obviously, um, if you're trying to look at something to change in the moment, like a flu shot, it's not gonna be the best case scenario. And you probably wanna wait that minimum of three months to look to see if you need to change anything. If you're looking at how to improve your flu shot campaign from this year to the next, then wait as much as you can to get really rich, great data that's gonna be more effective to drive those changes. Yep, and we certainly see the impact uh, of the reminders uh, happens within a shorter time frame than the eventual population getting flu shots. So there is a statistical measurement component that we apply to determine what we can take credit for in terms of an uplift from text messaging and what would have happened organically within the population. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a complicated answer on exactly how the measurement is done or how we complete that measurement. Uh, and a great question. And it does vary by gap in care that we are applying the message to. Yep. Okay, one more great question here. I'm gonna read this verbatim, uh, Jesse. And uh, I don't know if I have a great answer, uh, but let me, let me start here. And thank you, Stan, for the question. So uh, we execute 10,000 or more messages <clears throat> a week for our customers regarding transportation as a component of our service. Because of the high adoption, nearly 80%, which is great, assuming that's opt-in to a short code, our customers ask about using that channel for other purposes, uh, likely some of the ones we've talked to today. If the purpose of that text is different from transportation, are we able to separate adoption and not risk losing adoption for transportation needs? So a bit involved, but a great question. Yeah, and I think if I'm understanding this correctly, it's that they want their the customers are asking about using texting for other purposes. So they love texting so much. They're like, can you text us for stuff that's not transportation? Um, 
Yeah, you absolutely can. I don't know what other kind of purposes you have, but again, it's texting is great for any other reminders, um, little bits of health information that you want to give people over a course of time. Um, how are we able to separate adoption and not risk losing adoption? Yeah, so I'm wondering, Jesse, if it's they've got collected opt-ins specifically yeah. for transportation needs, can they use those opt-ins for a different program, like a text for baby or like a um, like a, a, a flu shot campaign? And that really depends on how the opt-in was was collected. So if your opt-in was universal, hey, do you want to get text messages from us? sign up, then you're, you're good to go. You could text them about anything. Um, if your opt-in was very specific and it said, we can text you about transportation options, then you probably need to rethink that opt-in. So it really depends on how you're handling it, but where there's a, well, there's a way we can make it work. Um, you know, you can talk to us if you're interested or talk to whoever you're partnering with your text messages right now, but I'm sure there's a way that you could text about different purposes um, and working with someone that can guide you through that strategy. You could figure out, okay, what other concerns do customers have and how will texting kind of help with that? Great. And uh, we could reiterate again, if we still didn't answer your question, hopefully that was a little more. What you yeah, think. it's a great involved question. So happy to yeah. kind of work that one offline if we need to Stan. Um, and I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. And this one's a great one from Alan. Any insights into the Medicare population, 65 and older, and their responsiveness to text messages? So yes, and we've got some interesting anecdotes here. Jesse, you know, add in, um, I'll, but I'll start with a, a, the, the answer first. So um, a lot of what we do at Virgin Pulse is predictive analytics using a very large data set to identify channel receptivity. So by age group, what are individuals most likely to respond to? Surprisingly, in the 65 and older population, um, they have very high engagement rates through IVR. Um, so outbound IVR phone calls. They prefer to talk on the phone to receive specific healthcare messaging, um, as opposed to all other age groups. Additionally, their second most engaged channel is SMS. So they do engage with SMS um, in addition to IVR. One other interesting thing we found out, we commissioned a study about two or three years ago around um, the millennial population. Surprisingly, one of the highest engaged channels for millennials is direct mail. So just to throw out a couple examples there, everybody's responsiveness to specific channels for healthcare outreach is different by age, experience, region, and a mechanism to identify each person's channel receptivity is really key to avoid abrasion and make sure you're using that person's channel of preference. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that uh, we have a lot of plans that are just Medicare and we have some dual plans um, and they're really receptive. Yeah, we don't, there, there was actually really funny. There was one state plan that we worked with that had all three. They had a duals, a Medicare and a Medicaid and their Medicare had the least amount of opt-outs and the most uh, responses to text. And that kind of floored everyone, including the client. So yeah, like they're receptive to it. They're, they, they like to text. All right. Well, I think we've got three minutes left. Um, so uh, to not go over, I think we've covered most of the information. We're certainly happy to answer uh, additional questions offline. Um, so again, feel free to reach out through the health plan at virginpulse.com email or reach out to us direct. Uh, we love, we'd love to uh, discuss further. And I think with that, uh, Patrick, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank uh, Jesse and Micah for that presentation. There's a lot of great take home knowledge. I know I learned a lot. Um, really the name of the game is, is member engagement, right? Especially with uh, PHG eventually um, um, no longer being with us probably later um, in the year. They'll let us know, of course. Um, so again, if you would like the slides, please contact um, Virgin Pulse at that email address there. You can also contact me. I'll be happy to forward any questions or requests onto the team here. Um, I also want to thank Virgin Pulse has been a very long time um, supporter and partner, silver partner of MHPA. They're going to be at our conference September 14 to 16th in Phoenix, MHPA 22. Uh, so please find them there. They have more information, more expertise to impart. Um, so again, I want to thank them and then also thank all of you for attending today. 
Um, and then next week we will be back with more webinars for you. So be on a lookout for that. And again, thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.